So my name is Frida Roberts, and I work at the Swedish Institute as head of the communications unit. Uh, and I'm here today to talk about digital nation branding, or how we communicate brand Sweden in a digital context. And I'm going to structure this talk um, as follows. Uh, I'm going to highlight a few challenges, key challenges that I think we all share working in communication 2014. And then I'm going to present this case, Curator of Sweden, Sweden's uh, official um, communication channel on, on Twitter, at Sweden. And then I'm going to finish off by illustrating how uh, we address these challenges or key questions through Curators of Sweden. Um, I'm also going to try to attempt to um, link the Swedish phenomena Fika uh, to brand Sweden. And I entirely blame Sasha for this part of the title because uh, it's, it's a bit of a stretch, but you have to bear with me. So, a few words about the Swedish Institute. Uh, it's a government agency and the Ministry for Foreign Affairs in Sweden. And we have a number of missions, a very multifaceted organization, but we have one overall um, objective, which is to promote interest, awareness, and build trust in civil societies in other countries. And what we do is often referred to as public diplomacy, uh, or nation branding. I think nation branding is maybe in this context a more common word. And uh, as opposed to, for instance, Goethe Institute, we do only have we only have one office uh, outside Sweden, which is in Paris. Instead, we work closely with the, the Swedish embassies and consulates all over the world because they, of course, have a unique understanding of the local audiences, which of course is necessary for us to package what we do. Uh, so it's relevant in a local context. And to do our job, we have uh, a very broad spectrum of different communication activities, ranging from everything from traditional printed material, uh, touring exhibitions, seminars, scholarships, all the way through to cutting-edge digital communication, of which I'm going to tell you a little bit more. So, is the world's perception of a country important? Is it worth spending taxpayers' money on this sort of activity? I think we're having a bit of a problem. Um, we actually know that there is a clear link between the awareness and trust in a country and that country's ability to uh, attract investment, business, tourists, name it. And given globalization and digitalization, the competition for attention is fiercer than ever before. And it's getting harder and harder for brands, including country brands, to cut through that noise of a global arena. So yes, the perception of a country is important for many reasons. And not the least for a country like Sweden, situated far up in the northern part of Europe, consisting of only 0.13% of the global population. Uh, today, Sweden actually have a, a pretty strong reputation in other countries. Having said that, we do face some challenges, of course. We know that the further away from Sweden you get, the lower is the awareness, thus also the trust in what we can offer. Uh, we also very often encounter outdated and, and sort of stereotypical ideas of what Sweden uh, has to offer that it's not based on a contemporary Sweden. ABBA, of course. Um, and thirdly, we also know that the awareness and knowledge in Sweden and what Sweden has to offer is decreasing among young people. And this is, of course, serious because they are the decision makers of tomorrow. Very annoying. Hmm? So, working in communication 2014, I think we can all agree that it's uh, amazing, exciting, inspiring, but also fiercely challenging. And there are so many challenges. And on a macro level, for me personally, the biggest challenge is the accelerating pace of change. 
really, really hard to keep up with everything happening out there. And it has an impact on so many different levels for us in working as communication um, professionals, not the least for the planning aspect. Uh, before, we planned for it on a yearly basis, and now more and more we see so-called hyper-planning, where we have to be more agile uh, and, and opportunistic. But having said that, the, the budget planning is still almost always on a yearly basis, so there's sort of a glitch there. Uh, so there are many, many challenges, but on more on a micro level, I'm going to go through then a few of questions or key questions that I think uh, should be answered, and then I'm going to show you how Curator of Sweden has addressed those key challenges. First key question, is it possible to control brands in a very complex and digital environment? Um, I believe that the last few years we have seen a complete paradigm shift in terms of power and control over our brands, shifting from the brand owners to the brand users, or the consumers, if you like. Um, and I heard somebody make a, um, saying that brands are a bit like our children, you have them for a while, and then they walk out in the world, and you lose control over them. And I think that is spot on how I see it. Another very, very important question working in communication is how do you build trust? Trust in your brand and trust in your organization. And we all know that we live in a network age where people, in general, actually trust complete strangers more than brand owners. Research tells us that seven out of 10 people, in terms of brand advice, actually listens to str strangers, whereas only one in 10 trust the brand owner. So who do you listen to? Who do you take advice from when you, for instance, buy a new dishwasher? I would guess that you check with family, friends, colleagues, and then very likely you check online reviews done by complete strangers. So this, of course, uh, is a very, very important question. And I saw a very interesting TED talk the other day by uh, Honora O'Neill, who is an English philosopher, and she talked about trust. And, and she had heard a lot about this, this, how do you build trust? But the question should be asked differently. It should be asked, how can you be perceived as trustworthy? How can you act in a way um, so that you give effective evidence of trustworthiness? And I think that is key. And one way of doing so, she mentioned, was by showing yourself as vulnerable as an organization. Because if you do so, that indicates that you really, really trust in what you have to offer. Very true. And how do you cut through that noise out there and connect, engage, and create emotions? How do you make your audience feel something for your brand? This is a vital component of, of brand building, of course. And another important uh, aspect for everybody working with content, not the least, is how do you encourage sharing? How do you return? How do you increase your return on investment? How do you amplify uh, your stuff? And sharing is not only about getting bigger reach. It's about, it tells you something. It tells you that what you're doing is relevant and interesting, unless you have a a very big media budget, this is a quick key question. And finally, and maybe most importantly, how do you bring about that change or action that is vital for your organization? What is your goal with your communication? May it be uh, increase awareness or, or generate sales or whatever, but your communication should in one way or other push that. So, we're now at Curators of Sweden. Uh, 
And this is, this is Sweden, it's about Sweden's official communication channel on Twitter, at Sweden. And personally, this, this project has been uh, the most inspiring and intense and frightening experience so far in my professional life. I've learned a lot, but most of it the hard way. And I think you will understand why in, in a moment. So, in December 2011, Sweden was the first country in the world to hand over complete and uncensored control of an official communication channel. This is the brand platform for country Sweden. It defines Sweden as open, authentic, caring and innovative. In one word, progressive. By that we mean a country that believes in progress, in, in change, but not overnight. We have no revolutions in Sweden. And so, so steady, slow, slow progress, and very importantly, on the terms and conditions of its people and its environment. And it was exactly these core values that we through Curator Sweden wanted to activate, demonstrate. We wanted to go from talking about Sweden as so open and authentic and innovative to actually proving it. And this is where we talk about story doing. So would you please uh, play the, the video? So I need some help from the tech people down there who has disappeared. Could you play the video, please? <laughs> No? There it is. And this is a little bit to illustrate the background. No presentation without technical problems. In Sweden, something unusual is happening. Normally, a country that has a Twitter account uh, has that account run by an official of the government. Not so in Sweden. Uh, the people there are, are actually in charge. In 2011, we became the first country in the world to let go of an official communication channel and hand it over to our citizens. Every week, someone in Sweden is at Sweden, sole ruler of the world's most democratic Twitter account. For seven days, he or she shares their everyday life, private opinions and general reflections. After that, someone else does the same, but differently. This is a simple way to give tips and advice on where to go on your holiday in Sweden. And a great way to interact with people around the world. You can come with us to a regular day at work or hang out with us on our free time, both in the busy city and out in the wild. The response was overwhelming. We attracted over 65,000 followers from 120 countries and started thousands of conversations. Sweden trended on Twitter worldwide, sparking discussions on transparency in social media and how technology can be used for democracy. The project has been featured all over the world and after six months the PR value is already 40 million dollars. Some think it's just a clever PR campaign. Others believe that it's a beacon of free speech in a time when we need it more than ever. For us, it's the only way to paint a fair picture of Sweden for the rest of the world. Swede by Swede, tweet by tweet. So, as is often the case, the, the essence of this concept goes way back before the launch. Sweden has a long uh, history of democratization, and we have had uh, companies, movements, organization, there's a bit of a problem, I think. <laughs> okay. Could you go back one slide, please? 
Um, yeah. Uh, so I think you all recognize these Swedish brands. And uh, they have all, in different way, democratized the way we live, drive, uh, how we um, communicate with each other, and how we consume popular culture. Let's see if this works instead. So this is not working. Uh, I'm not sure I, if I'm getting any attention from the IT guys down there. It's not working. This one doesn't work. Uh, anyway, to recap, Uh, just to recap, so how, how does it work? It's actually very, very simple. Every week, there's a new curator taking over control of At Sweden, and for seven days, he or she contributes with his or hers uh, unique uh, stories, areas of interest, competence, life stories, and for the following Monday, somebody else does the same, but completely differently. Uh, <laughs> Hello, you guys. It's not working. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, so far, we have had over 100 curators uh, contributing with a hundred different profiles. Um, and of course, the result is not one perfect streamlined image of Sweden, but several. And OK. <laughs> uh, so there's, there's, instead of having this perfect streamlined image, we believe that this actually presents the diversity of, uh, of Sweden the Sweden of today. So tweet by tweet and curator by curator, we're building this sort of diversified, authentic, and updated image of our country. OK, now you can change. Sorry about this. So can they do exactly whatever, whatever they like, our curators? Uh, it is an uncensored channel, but of course we have a couple of rules, and they are they are not allowed to break the law, and they are not allowed to promote any of their products or services. Apart from that, they can tweet of about whatever they like. They have no guidelines or instructions in terms of uh, topics. We, of course, uh, maintain the right to, if they break the, uh, any of the rules, to intervene, of course. Incidents. So has this high-risk project generated any incidents so far? Uh, yes, indeed, it has. Uh, but we have lived through them. Uh, and I believe it is actually the incidents that, in practice, um, have tested and validated the strengths behind this project. And there are three in particular that are very important, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about them, and you will understand what I mean when I say that they have tested and validated the sort of essence of this project. You can change. You can change slides now. OK. Uh, the very first um, um, incident happened or coincided with one of the very first tweets uh, in, uh, in this project. Uh, the first, uh, first curator, Jack, he jump started this project by being incredibly informal and open and, and f funny, actually. OK. It's going from bad to worse now. OK. And uh, 
he guided, just like a regular sort of tourist organization, he guided our followers to Swedish sites, but maybe in a sort of a different way, an unconventional way. You can change slide. And uh, it, it got a fantastic response. And he got many, many questions about life in Sweden. And he got one question which is extremely re relevant living in Sweden. And that is, how do you survive the, the cold, long, and dark Swedish winters? And he answered, I guess I'm drinking a lot of coffee, lighting my face up with my laptop, and hanging out with friends. Oh, and you know, masturbation. So remember, this is an official communication channel. And it's like day two in the project or something like that. And Swedish Institute is under the Ministry for Foreign Affairs. So, And at that very moment, um, I was thinking, you know, have we opened Pandora's box? So in theory, everybody likes, loves, not everybody, sorry. Most of us love freedom of speech. But when you, you sort of go live, there will be frictions. And uh, I remember walking up the stairs to our director general at the Swedish Institute with very heavy steps. And just, you know, by, by the way, Annika, uh, you, so you know, they're right now tweeting about masturbation on Sweden's official communication channel on Twitter. Uh, and of course, like, wanted them to talk about Swedish innovation and Swedish culture and and so on, and, but they do as well, so. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, this is when we got this letter from a so-called social media expert located in, in uh, uh, London. I work in digital and I'm quite shocked to see what's happening on your Twitter account, etc., etc. And this letter, of course, assumed that we had no idea what was happening on the account or we would have closed it down, right? Yeah. Or maybe not. Could you change the slide? OK, this is not in order. Uh, OK. Well, anyway, so this got a lot of international uh, attention. A little tweet like that in a Swedish context is not a very big deal, but of course, from an international context, it's crazy. And as always, when something is completely new and never been done before, people was wondering, you know, is this genius or, or is it madness? And could it really be true that Sweden is crazy enough to hand over complete and uncensored control to one citizen? But you all know that it's not about one citizen. Every week, there's a new uh, citizen or, or person who contributes with, with his or her little piece of the jigsaw, Sweden. New slide. So the world has, through this, this initiative, been able to visit Swedish countryside and, and, and Swedish farms and... Hello? This is ridiculous. It's better if you, if you look at me, then I don't have to scream at you every time. <laughs> and uh, the world has also had the privilege to take part of, of Swedish taste in, in films or, or also Swedish food culture. Here we have the kebab pizza, which is a wonderful result of our immigration policies in, in Sweden. It's actually delicious. It might not look like it, but it is delicious. So now, when international media understood that this was actually not just a PR campaign, but this was actually an account that was 100% transparent uh, and uncontrolled, we got even more international uh, attention. And also the fact that we didn't censor this particular tweet uh, got a lot of attention, of course. So it was time for the second uh, incident. Uh, there, was two, there were two Swedish journalists, Shiblen and Persson, who were prosecuted and convicted for terrorist crime in Ethiopia. 
And this was actually a very big deal in Sweden, got a lot of attention. And that week's curator, Hassan, strongly attacked the Swedish foreign minister, Carl Bildt, from an official communication channel and in front of the whole world. We held our breath. And for instance, I mean, he, it was, he was quite harsh. And again, from a Swedish context or perspective, this might not be such a big deal, uh, but from an international uh, point of view. And we had a lot of so-called media, so social media experts that again said, you know, this was a fun experiment, and maybe now is the time to pull the plug. You know, this is not the image we want to perceive. Uh, but we felt that this was just another test, and that Sweden has a strong enough freedom of speech to survive this sort of situation, even though this included the Swedish foreign minister and an official communication channel. So the only thing we did, actually, to respond to this was to introduce a new hashtag for future curators, just to sort of um, push the fact that it's, it's, not, it's their personal opinion expressed on this channel, not official Sweden's uh, opinions, because we got that question fairly often in the beginning. So does Sweden, an official Sweden, endorse the opinions expressed on this channel? And the only thing Sweden endorses is the right to express your opinion, providing they are within the law, of course. So it quickly became one of the most recommended accounts in the world, and we had a steadily increasing number of followers. Uh, and with regards to followers, we have seen a very interesting phenomenon, which is that every week we get a new bunch of followers, and every week we lose a whole bunch of followers. And that is due to the fact that it's like a new account every week. The profiles are so different. So we choose, we, we want to give a diversified image, so they are so different to each other. And the, it's actually not the number of followers that is important, it's the level of interaction because that tells us something about uh, the content, uh, and it indicates that it is engaging. So we got a lot of international media, and we found ourselves on the front page of Sunday, uh, New York Times Sunday edition, which, of course, was uh, amazing. And, and this particular article, uh, pointed out that there is no such thing like as a typical Swede. And it sort of focused on our diversity, and this was exactly what we wanted. And so we were, we were on, on a real high after this. But then, two days later, bam. Uh, the third and the most serious incident so far in this project um, happened. Uh, Sonia Abrahamson uh, took over the account uh, one week in June, and she, was, she had an incredible week. She was extremely active, uh, provocative, funny, and she tweeted about absolutely everything. But there was one tweet that got more attention than all of them together. Now it's going to be interesting, because we have a film, okay? And this is Stephen Colbert, of Daily Show, and uh, he will tell you a little bit more about this particular tweet. Or not. Sonia Abramson also brought some attention to Sweden with her charming question, what's the fuzz with Jews? You can't even see if a person is a Jew unless you see their penises, and even if you do, you can't be sure. <laughs> Turns out an Aryan-looking woman asking how to identify Jews caused quite the fuzz. Mm. I remember that exact moment when I saw this in my feed. And it was a beautiful evening in June, and I had my team home for dinner. Emma was there. And uh, I just thought, God, this is going to explode. <laughs> and so it did. Uh, my telephone started ringing, and 
and then it rang for 48 hours. And I had to go and get my husband to say, just take over. And I just, you know, worked for pretty much 48 hours because of the time difference. And it was an incredible media frenzy. I, I mean, it was witch hunt beyond belief. And I don't know if anybody of you have had to endure that, but it was terrifying. And I just couldn't believe it. It spread like wildfire and different time zones and different languages. And, and the, the interesting thing here is that this person, we, we try to avoid to comment on particular tweets, but she is a well-known anti-racist. So this illustrates, of course, the difficulty with intercultural communication. But we took this extremely serious, naturally, and we met up and we discussed with the lawyer as well whether or not she had broken any laws. But the conclusion was that this was not even in the gray zone. Uh, and again, a lot of the, of the social media experts felt that, you know, time to pull the plug. Finally, you know, experiment is over. But we decided in the end to, to stick by the project uh, because as I said, no rules, no laws had been broken. But it was difficult uh, and a very humbling experience. Um, of course, could we? So this is just some of the wonderful media that we got. Uh, why did Sweden hand its national Twitter account over to a troll? Not very flattering. What well, is some other examples? How about this one? Sweden's noble Twitter experiment falling apart like an IKEA desk. <laughs> it was extremely negative. And the volume was incredible. And the epicenter of this was in the US. So the uh, Swedish embassy in Washington had, they got attacked by media from all daily newspapers, TV stations, radio stations, etc. So, but then something very peculiar happened. After about two days, after this media witch hunt, the tone in media leveled out, and now the, the media started focusing on the fact that we hadn't censored Sonia's tweet, that we had not closed down the channel, and by not doing so, in practice, proving Swedish freedom of speech. And it's really interesting experience because how something so pitch dark and so negative so quickly could be something positive. And I think that says something about social media and the global aspect with social media. So we started seeing articles like this, and this is a very nice one from The New Yorker which highlighted the fact that we hadn't censored Sonia, Sonia's tweet, and by not doing so, proving our point. And again, this is illustrates the challenges with intercultural communications, and it's not only about language barriers and potential misunderstanding there. There's differences in, in social norms, religions, uh, areas, topics that are taboo in some cultures, and then add on top of that uh, global digital intercultural communication, and, and you have a challenge, um, not the least with, with you know, the real-time aspects and, and uh, the, the time differences. Very challenging, but fun. So I get this question a lot, so behind the scene, admit that you were close to closing down, shutting down the project. And even though this was, I said, a very humbling uh, experience, and I was terrified at times, we weren't ever close to shutting down the project. And despite these incidents and some others, uh, these are the three worst incidents, and I believe that there's three strong reasons for that. First of all, this is not a PR campaign. This is an activation of important Swedish values. It's 
about walking the talk. And secondly, the infrastructure of this project is very forgiving since you know, we change curator every week. So one week can be big drama and then quiet the next. So. And thirdly, it, Curator Sweden is not about one tweet and it's not about one curator. It's about the totality over time, the image we're building over time. So topics, what do they talk about? Since we give no directions, um, uh, is it just nonsense? Interestingly enough, we took all the... Could you go back one, please? Um, we took, through an external expert, I might add, we took all the tweets from 2012 and analyzed, and also the interaction, what had engaged. And without steering or moderating the discussions or conversations at all, it turns out that the topics being discussed and the topics that engages more or less corresponds to what official Sweden prioritizes in its global communication. So that's, that's, that's really nice because if you look at it from the other side, that sort of confirms that the topics that we do prioritize are the topics that are engaging. So tourism nature is uh, number one, naturally. And with curator, COS means curator of Sweden, and then it's mainly the, the, the angle of uh, democracy and freedom of speech. So results, I mean, we're handling taxpayers' money, so of course result is very, very important. And in terms of return on investments, this has been, without a doubt, one of our more successful projects. Uh, it's a fairly low budget project, as you, you might understand. <clears throat> and then we look at things like uh, PR value and ad value. And over and above that, we have won more than 45 uh, communications awards with the uh, Grand Prix in, in Cannes as its crown jewel. And I'm particularly proud of uh, about the jury's motivation when they uh, decided to give us this prize, because it was just a few days after the Sonia incident. And in their motivation, one of the reasons they, they felt that we, we should win was the way we had handled the project in times of crisis. Uh, very nice. And they also used Curator Sweden as an example of an, a very important communication shift in the communication industry, which is going from storytelling to proving your values in practice to story doing. So that was very nice. Uh, it has also led to a global movement. I don't know if you heard of rotation curation, which is uh, a result of, of uh, this project. And there's a number of uh, initiatives following this idea of having different people curating a channel for a limited time period. So there are regions and uh, cities, uh, there are country accounts, but they're not official. Um, but there are official town and region accounts, and there's a lot of consumer brands, and Olympic Games did it, and yeah, there's, there's a lot. And, and very often they actually thank Sweden for the initiative, which is sort of flattering. But most importantly, in terms of results, through this initiative, we have managed to reach people and connect and interact with them in over 120 countries in the world, and hopefully provided them a updated and authentic image of our country, which is far more than and red cottages and elks and kids dancing around midsummer poles and these sort of stereotypical ideas. So, back to key challenges and how Cur Curator of Sweden addresses those challenges. Control, the issue of control, or the fact that we can't control our brands in a 
digital environment. <clears throat> and Curator Sweden actually embraces that fact and invites an uncontrolled and uncensored dialogue onto its own platform. And trust. You can actually go one further. Uh, so it builds trust through different way. One is that it's 100% aligned with the brand. So it delivers on the brand promise. It's actually an activation of these core values. That's one very important aspect when you build a brand. And if you remember, I talked about this, about being trustworthy that uh, Honora O'Neill was talking about. And one way is to be vulnerable, show, show that you're vulnerable. And here we are indeed showing ourselves vulnerable, handing over control. And that in itself is a way of building trust. And another important aspect is also that, as I said before, people trust people more than brand owners. And here we're letting over control to ordinary people. People listen to people. So there are several ways we're actually addressing that issue. And how do we make people feel something through Curator of Sweden? How do we engage and connect on an emotional level, which is very important in brand building? And we do this by humanizing our content. So people, again, listen to real people and compare that emotional effect to when a government agency such as the Swedish Institute communicates. It has a very different emotional effect, wouldn't you agree? Yeah, here we have people again. We have had zero media budget, Curator Sweden. We have done no marketing. But what we did was we did something that other people wanted to talk about. So the fact that we handed over control was in itself so interesting that other people wanted to tell the world about it. That's one aspect. Then the actual content. As you know, Twitter is, is, is um, very useful if you want to encourage sharing. So we have a platform which also opens up for sharing our content. How does uh, Curator Sweden bring about the change that we are looking for. And here we're talking about increasing awareness and interest in Sweden, and also changing outdated perceptions, stereotypical ideas of Sweden. And I believe that by, by using people, normal people, this is exactly what we're doing. Um, we are moving away from that stereotypical idea of what Sweden has to offer. Finally, Fika. I don't know if Sasha is here. I don't think so. Um, and how Fika can be linked to brand Sweden. And that it, this is a tricky one. I don't know if, if you know what Fika is. No. It's, uh, and there's no real good translation, but it would be coffee break if you if you uh, did a direct translation. But it is so much more than a coffee break. Uh, it's, it's a very important tradition in Sweden. We had it for a long, long, long time. It's about taking a break, uh, changing the scene, exchanging ideas, uh, drinking your coffee, of course, and very often with something sweet. And if you go to Sweden, you will encounter this. There's, there's no way if not to. And we do it at work, we do it uh, after work, um, and it's very informal. And I, I believe that there are many great ideas that have been produced through Fika. And I always encourage my team to take at least one Fika break a day. And it's actually, most, most offices, most workplaces in Sweden, this is something which is encouraged. And you go off, you change perspective, you talk about other things, or work if you like, and you come back refreshed. So, again, the brand Sweden and Fika. If you really, really try hard, you could argue that 
Fika actually is an embodiment, <laughs> am I laughing? An embodiment of Swedish core values. It's open and inviting. We often sit down with people we at work, for instance, that we don't know before, exchange ideas. Um, it's caring and including. We might have baked. That we, 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 we have, it's a, a very easy way of saying, let's go and grab a coffee. Um, it's innovative in the sense that it has evolved uh, over time. Uh, maybe 10, 15 years ago, we drank just normal co coffee and had, you know, the cinnamon buns. And now, we, if you go out and have a fika in, in, in Stockholm or, or in any place in Sweden, there's um, so many different sorts of coffee you can choose, choose between. And finally, authentic. That's a tricky one. It's a tradition. It's changing and it's progressive, but it's also a tradition that we kept for a very, very long time. So I don't know if I wrapped it up there, but I at least had a go. So thank you, Sasha, for that one. <laughs> it's your fault. So finally, thank you for your patience. And sorry about all the technical problems. And uh, if you have any questions, then you're more than welcome to ask them. Thank you.